Hey guys, so we're gonna go over Hoya information, care tips, and propagation today. Now this has been one of my more requested videos, and I think it's because Hoya have just become a very popular houseplant. And I think that's for good reason. For one, they're relatively a non-fussy plant to grow in the home, especially the more traditionally cultivated varieties, many of which you actually see on the table here today. Secondly, they're fairly easy to propagate. Now there are some that are a little bit more challenging than others, which I'll touch upon, but for the most part, the ones that you could find in the nursery or in the garden center are relatively easy to propagate, especially when you're comparing them to other houseplant species. And thirdly, it's for their really beautiful, fragrant blooms. Now, unfortunately, none of them are actually flowering today, but I'll show you what their blooms look like. But they're really gorgeous. They have this kind of waxy appearance, and that's actually where they get their common name, which is wax plants or wax flowers. Now, if you go to the garden center or a plant shop, you may see around three to five different types of species of Hoya. And that is just a small subset of the many different types of Hoya that you'll actually see out there. But there's also many different varieties of Hoya. And I'll give you a good example of that. This is Hoya carnosa, and this is probably one of the longest run cultivated species of Hoya that there has been out there. But there are so many different types of varieties of this particular plant. I have two that are here that I could show you today. This is Hoya carnosa compacta, and you'll see it has these like really thick, succulent, roughly kind of leaves, and this happens to be the variegated variety of Hoya carnosa compacta. And then you actually see this one, which is Hoya carnosa crimson, which is another type of variegated one, and the crimson one just happens to have a little bit more of a reddish stem. So you could collect so many different types of Hoya. It might be the same species, but just a different variety. But if you actually step back and you look at the amount of species that are actually out in the world, you might read that there's somewhere between 300 and 400 species. But in speaking with a number of Hoya collectors and botanists and botanic gardens, they're probably somewhere between 600 and 700 species of Hoya. But there is a lot of discrepancy out there for a number of different reasons. One, it just hasn't been recorded all that well because some people might actually collect a Hoya in a certain part of the world and another Hoya in another part of the world and give it two different names and it actually might be the same species. And of course, if you're actually walking in the wild, none of them have plant tags on, unfortunately. So if you kind of collect a Hoya species, it might look very similar to another one and you might name it the same name but it actually might be different species. And it's really hard to kind of tell how they differ unless they're in flower. And a lot of times Hoya are not in flower. One of the other things is that their center of diversity comes from the subtropics and the tropical region. So primarily around Australasia. And most of them are kind of growing between sea level and a thousand meters. There are some that are much higher altitude and those are actually the more challenging ones to grow in the home. But for the most part, the ones that you're seeing here, Hoya carnosa, Hoya multiflora, Hoya bella, and then also this Hoya publicalix in the back are easier to grow because they're growing within that kind of band that doesn't require high altitude conditions. Now let's talk about lighting because this is something that I got woefully wrong in my beginning journeys of growing Hoya. Most Hoya, as I had mentioned, have some sort of succulency to their leaves. So this made me want to stick it right in a southern window, which, you know, for all intents and purposes is a lot of intense light. And most Hoya actually grow in the gaps. They're considered gap species in the wild. And they're growing in a little bit more diffuse light underneath treetops. So you're going to want to pull most of your Hoyas away from a southern facing window. Maybe give it a little bit more like an eastern exposure or something that has a little bit more indirect but still bright light. And your Hoyas are going to be a heck of a lot happier. Also, let's take a look at their growth structure. Now Hoya carnosa, which you're already familiar with, looks like it's a little bit more like a hanging basket plant, 
but you could start to see the stems kind of tendril around. You probably see it a little bit more here in this uh, Hoya Carnosa Crimson. And if you give this a trellis, it'll start to wrap itself around. As a matter of fact, like I had a, um, this is a Hoya Publicalix, so you can see how this is starting to tendril. I had the Hoya Publicalix in, in, in the back uh, growing on my bookshelf, and I went to kind of pull the plant off, and I made the huge mistake because it was like attached to every other plant, and it just kind of tumbled down, and I had a huge mess on my hands. So if you're growing Hoya in the home, just be careful because it's probably going to be tendriling somewhere else, especially if you get one of these more vining species. Now others have this kind of bushy erect habit, and this is called Hoya multiflora. And I should say that this one is so different from most of the other Hoya species that some taxonomists want to actually put this in its own genus. But for, for now, I'm just gonna leave this as Hoya multiflora. You could also see, if you look up more closely, that these leaves are like super thin, they're a, a little bit darker, and this is a little bit more of the terrestrial species, because I'm gonna go over the fact that a lot of these are growing epiphytically. You're gonna take care of this one a little bit differently than the others that you see here. And then you also have this Hoya bella, which is sometimes considered a subspecies of Hoya lanceolata. And this one is beautiful, like this beautiful kind of pendant hanging basket plant. And then finally you have a growth structure that's a little bit more in the middle of these two guys. So this is one of my favorite Hoyas. This is Hoya comungiana. And it has this kind of upright growth structure and then it starts to hang itself over, very similar to Hoya bella. But if you actually go in the wild, you'll find that Hoya are a little bit more like a gap species of plant. So gap species mean they're kind of growing in certain gaps within the canopy. As unfortunately their habitat starts to decline and people are cutting down trees, sometimes they're actually finding Hoyas in those trees that are uh, coming down and then they're, they're collected from that point. But it's part of the reason why I actually have this Hoya here, which has been mounted not by me, but by um, the potted elephant. And this is a Hoya pachycleta. And you'll see that it has this kind of wood and the roots are wrapped around with um, some sphagnum, long fiber sphagnum moss. And uh, they have some fishing line here that kind of tacked this on. And this is a really cool way to actually display your Hoya. Um, however, you do have to water this a little bit more because this will dry out relatively quickly. Which actually brings me to how most of us actually grow Hoya in our homes, which is in a planter pot. It is important that your Hoya actually dries out really quickly. And because these are epiphytic species, meaning growing on another plant, they do have a tendency to dry out. And it's important that you don't keep their roots wet because that is a surefire way that you're going to kill your Hoya. So what I'd like to show you is a little bit more of my Hoya mix that I often use in my home. And I'm gonna do that with some of these Espoma organic products because this is mainly kind of the mix I use for all of my epiphytic species. So if you take a good close look at this, you'll see a little bit more of what this mixture looks like. So basically how I've mixed this here is by using about a third of each of these. So a third organic cactus mix. You could also just use a, a regular potting mix, which looks a little bit more like this. So you could see it has a little bit more kind of peat and some perlite. And then about a third of perlite, which this is just basically puffed volcanic stone. So kind of like, think of like popcorn, like corn being popped. This is like the volcanic stone actually being popped. So some people might kind of say, oh, this I always thought this was like styrofoam and it kind of has that feel for it. But this is a way to give it uh, the soil mixture a lot more aeration. And then about a third of organic orchid mix. And this is a much more barkier mix that you could see here. It has a little bit of a piece of um, charcoal and it has some perlite in it as well. But roughly, if you get this to about a third, a third, a third, you get a mixture that looks like this. And this is important because as I had mentioned, Hoya are epiphytic and they like to dry out a little bit more than others. 
I do want to make an exception for Hoya multiflora because this is a common plant that you could actually find. And this is a much more terrestrial species. So it doesn't like to dry out as much as the other Hoyas that actually you see here on this table. That, so that is something that you want to consider if you have a Hoya multiflora. One thing that you could do is add a little bit more of the cactus mixture to your soil or not, uh, a regular potting medium to your soil. So uh, you might just wanna put in uh, a few more shovelfuls of that, or you could just water it a little bit more frequently than the other ones. One of the things I'd like to mention is that some Hoya are commonly found in more limestone regions. So they have a little bit more of an alkaline soil. And the way that we kind of describe this is having a sweeter soil, which just means it's a little higher in alkalinity. Now, if you go with too much peat, that might be a little bit more acidic for a plant such as Hoya comingiana. So I'm gonna show you a really easy tip in making your soil a little bit more alkaline. I actually use some crushed oyster shells and I actually got these because my chicken needs them because she needs a little bit more higher calcium in order to produce her eggs, but she actually doesn't like oyster shells. She prefers her crushed egg shells. So you could actually wash out some of your egg shells and crush them and put them on the top of the soil, or you could get these crushed oyster shells, which I think are also um, cheap and it's easy to do. So any of your Hoya species that require a little bit more limestone or alkaline soil, that's a really great way in order to be able to make sure that your soil and your potting medium is not too acidic. But for the most part, most Hoya are going to want this kind of well draining mixture. And like I said, it's about a third potting medium, a third perlite, and a third of this barky kind of orchid mix. So now that we got that covered, we're going to go into Hoya propagation. Now Hoya can be propagated a number of different ways. One is through seed, but we're not gonna to touch upon that today because Hoya usually never sets seed indoors. I'm going to focus a little bit more on propagating from stems. Now these that you see here, one is actually propagating in water and another is in long fiber sphagnum. And I had been re-trellising my plant, so it was on one trellis and I wanted to trellis it on another. And I have to say these were like probably 60 feet long and it was very hard to unwrap itself. So I ended up breaking off some of these by accident. But as you'll see here, I'm gonna pull this out and you could see that I put this in kind of just regular water propagation and you could see all these little different nodes on the stem started to root up and that is a very strong rooted plant right there. So I could actually propagate this into a soil substrate pretty readily. Now, if you look at this one, I'm gonna pull this out of some sphagnum. It's really rooted in there, so give me a little bit of a moment to show you. Oh, but if you look over here, you could see that they rooted up very nicely within this sphagnum. In fact, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge kind of removing some of the sphagnum from the root. And it's okay, actually, if you bring some of that sphagnum with you, but if you take a close look at that, you could see those roots also look pretty good as well. What I've found is that um, in this case, this Hoya, which has a nice thick meaty stem, will root a lot quicker and put out a lot more roots in the water. But what I've also found is that the ones that uh, root in sphagnum has a little bit of an easier time going into this, the soil substrate. I don't think you have to actually remove all the sphagnum all that much. And we'll see if this one actually rooted as well. And you can see that this one only has a little tiny root and it might only be because that this stem right here kind of broke maybe on the way down. So I'm gonna snip that off and keep part of the root. So if you've seen any of my other propagation videos, you'll know that I really treat long fiber sphagnum as a natural resource that we don't get a lot of. So I actually reuse this over and over again. So I'm just gonna clean this up and put this back in here because I'll probably end up rooting more plants back in here. And if you know that the plant doesn't have any kind of disease agent or any kind of uh, pest, uh, 
then it's totally safe to actually use the sphagnum again. So I just cleaned up the table a little bit here, but one of the things I wanted to show you before we end up propagating this is you'll notice that some of the stem actually dried out and became pretty brown and woody. And you could actually just remove that. And I should give a little bit of disclaimer here that many different types of Hoya actually put out their, what is called their spurs and their peduncles out on the ends of their stem. And that is actually where the flowers start to bud and bloom. You don't want to cut that off at all, but this particular stem is just dried up and this will never get a flower on it. So you, if any of those types of things that you see, um, this one is also a great example of this. This has a little bit of a dried structure right here. Now, you only really need one to two nodes if you actually want to go and propagate this again. So this one has a leaf right here, and you'll see that there, if you get close on the stem here, there are all these like little adventitious roots or these little nodes kind of growing on this stem. These will all actually start to get roots. So I'm actually gonna cut this right here. And in some cases you'll see that uh, it's very common that Hoyas start to um, push out this sap, this like lactiferous sap. Sometimes it's clear and sometimes it's white sap depending on the type of species. And that is super common for this particular family, which is a Pondanaceae family. Um, also the dogbane or the milkweeds are in the same family. So if you're familiar with milkweeds, you'll get that kind of white latexy substance. I do know some people who actually put a little thing of glue at the end of this, but I don't actually do that. So I'm gonna take this plant right here and put this back into the sphagnum and kind of root that up because you don't need all of those leaves in order to be able to root your Hoya. And that's the amazing thing about Hoya is that you could just propagate so many of them with very little nodes. So I'm gonna take these two right here that have roots or these three, and I'm going to start to uh, start growing them in this little container right here. So what I'll do is just add some of the soil that we just made. And the reason why I have this Hoya publicalix over here is because this one it has been recently rooted from a cutting. Very similar to these guys. And you may recognize that I'm putting this Hoya in a fairly small pot. And that is totally customary when it comes for most Hoyas because they are epiphytic plants. Many of them are epiphytic plants and they have their roots kind of exposed on these trees and they're used to and comfortable kind of growing in smaller or tighter situations. So and many times if you're actually going to be repotting your Hoya like within two to three years, just because some of the organic matter might have broken down, you don't actually often have to repot them in a larger pot, which you know, would be customary for, for most house plants. So this plant is pretty much potted up and ready for display, but I also want to go over fertilizing your Hoya. Now I live in the Northern hemisphere, so my growing season is spring, summer, and fall. So I'm gonna be doing the bulk of my fertilizing during that period. But if you're somebody who's lucky enough to be an eternal summer, then you're probably gonna be fertilizing all year round. Now I am going to be using these organic indoor fertilizers. And what's great about these, they're very gentle. So you never risk on over fertilizing your plant. And I'll show you how to use these shortly. But I also pulled out this one, which is an orchid bloom booster. And the reason why I pulled this one out is because when you see your Hoya starting to bud and almost in bloom, then you could be fertilizing with something like this that has a little bit more of a higher phosphorus, um, which is important for plants that are about to bloom. So typically what you want to do is, I just potted this one up as you saw, and you just want to give a little bit of water you know, throughout here. 
And I am going to take this watering can, which has pretty much a quart of water. And what you wanna do is shake this up. And what's great about this is that it's super easy to pour. So just do one pour like that within a quart of water and just let that swish around and dilute a little bit. But that pretty much dissolves right away. And you're just gonna pour a little bit more throughout there. And because you have a well-draining mixture of soil, you're not going to really worry too much about overwatering this particular plant. And as a matter of fact, there's no water that has come out from the bottom here. So you could see that the soil probably has taken on some moisture, but not a total amount. If you even want to water a little bit more so that some of the water actually comes out from the bottom, then that is totally fine too. But those are some of the basic tips that you have for growing Hoya indoors. And remember, there's so many different types of varieties that you might be able to actually find out there, but some of the most common ones we actually highlighted today. Have you been head over heels for Hoya or have you yet to grow one in your home? Tell me in the comments below. And stay tuned because there will be more Hoya related videos in the coming weeks. If you like this video, then give it a thumbs up and support the channel by clicking the subscribe button. Be sure to hit the notifications bell so you don't miss another video. Otherwise, you can find me on the blog at homesteadbrooklyn.com and on Instagram at homesteadbrooklyn. Lastly, if you're keen to brush up on your houseplant knowledge, then check out the first comprehensive course on houseplants at houseplantmasterclass.com.